Hi, Dick. Hey, how you doing? Good. Good to see you. Welcome to the debrief. Good to see you. Good to be it's, here. This is going to be fun. Um, all right. Before we jump in, I'm going to cover a couple housekeeping notes for the folks at home. Uh, so first, this will be recorded. So if you need to jump out for a sec, no worries. Whoa, yeah. whoa, okay. whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Right. You know, <laughs> so there's both the business and you got to, you know, not everybody can make it or people got to use the bathroom. Right. So they got to be able to you know, catch up on what happened. And we got to be able to splice this apart until, you know, great little snippets. Anyway, you can see the highlights. Uh, number two, uh, if you want to put Dick on the spot, there's an ask a question uh, field at the bottom of the of the window here. So you can throw a question in and I'll try to get to uh, all the ones that seem interesting and relevant along the way. Uh, and finally, for the first timers out there, uh, this is the debrief presented by Bright Hire. Uh, the debrief is a series of conversations with founders, executives, and talent thought leaders on how they built talented and diverse teams. I'm your host. Teddy Chestnut, co-founder of Bright Hire, and today I am truly thrilled uh, to welcome uh, investor, workout enthusiast, improv comic, serial entrepreneur, uh, oh, and the guy who grew Twitter from like zero dollars in revenue to two billion dollars in revenue uh, as CEO, uh, no big deal, uh, Dick Coslow. Dick, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, thanks for having me. That was quite an introduction. There you go. I put a bunch of labels in there, right? Investor, entrepreneur, workout enthusiast, CEO, which actually resonates with you? Like, what when you think about yourself? Like, what's the label that you yeah. think of today? The one where you said the guy—that's the <laughs> one that resonates with me the most. Perfect. Nice. <laughs> you know, no, seriously. I mean that sincerely. Like, I'm just this guy from you know Detroit. I like grew up there, born and raised in the Midwest. It's kind of always felt like you know, what am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> well, but, but here you are. But here we are. Uh, all right. So we're going to jump in and, and talk about how you built, you know, all the teams that you've run, not just Twitter, but the, the couple companies that you started before that. Uh, but we'll start with a little bit of like friendly rapid fire. Um, right. You did improv at Second City. Who was the yes. most talented person you ever worked with? Uh, Eric Hoffman or Steve Carell. Steve and I showed up the same day at Second City. Um, probably Eric Hoffman, who many people haven't heard of, but he was extraordinarily funny. The challenge for Eric was, it turns out that Lauren Michaels doesn't like it if you are, um, if you, in comedy, they call it working blue, if you swear. Lauren Michaels doesn't like it if you swear during your audition for SNL. And Eric did a, a monologue where he swore a lot, and that was it for him. He never, never got hired. Um, but Steve Carell or Eric Hoffman, both of those two, they're both the both the moment you're on stage with them, you know you're in the presence of like a real talent. Was it was it just talent, or was it like those guys also like just worked harder than everybody else, or was it just like they were no. talent? Just talent. <laughs> <laughs> Something you could work all no. that would never be never be. I like. mean, it's improv. There's not really anything to work at. So uh, no, it's true. Like Steve or Eric, if you were on stage with them, they were just you know every single time you were on stage with them, you're like, wow, where did that come from? Right. So all right. Um, according to your Twitter feed, you're teaching yourself to cook Italian food, like an Italian grandmother. Why? Um, I'm actually learning to do two things this year, only one of which I've been posting about. The other one is I'm um, shooting a gun, but not at, only at or random targets. Only, tar only at random targets, just because I... So I wanted to teach myself to cook Italian like an Italian grandmother, meaning no recipes, no measuring cups, no measuring spoons, just like, you know, taste it if it's wrong. And um, I've got someone helping me do that. And I've got someone helping me with the other one too. The, so the idea was I want to, it, it turns out if you try to learn a couple new skills um, a year or a couple new skills every, every couple of years, it's just um, turns out to be a good thing to do uh, just for mental stimulation and learning and keeping yourself, um, on your toes and the Italian cooking and the shooting struck me as two things that might be useful in the future. One more, one more immediately useful than the other. <laughs> what is, what's more gratifying and you can be honest, making people laugh or helping them grow? Oh man. I mean, helping them grow is the most gratifying. Making people laugh is fun. I mean, my, uh, Tony Wang, the guy who, um, we, he was hired into Twitter as an, uh, an attorney on the legal team. And then he actually opened the, 
he opened our London office. He was one of the first three people over in London and opened our London office. He always used to say, Dick will interrupt any meeting and stop any conversation if he thinks of something funny. But that's just like for kicks, helping people grow and helping people learn and be better is a blast. That's what I, all the stuff that I remember about Twitter is when, you know, are the people whose careers I helped. Cool. Um, flip side, what's worse? The moment on stage when you realize you're bombing or the moment in business when you realize that you have to deliver bad news to your team? Uh, delivering bad news to the team, is, of, of course, is the, is way worse. I mean, you're bombing on stage. You're like, oh, well, it worked last people, night. People it didn't are, work. Tonight. We'll try again people tomorrow. Are, people are terrified of bombing. I mean, people aren't, aren't terrified of bombing. Listen, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a funny story. I was on stage at around 11 p.m., maybe even midnight. Um, at the Adelaide Comedy Festival, Adelaide, Australia. Um, we we're in the Adelaide Opera House, of all things. You might be wondering, how does a city as small as Adelaide have an opera house? But it does. See, it's around, see, it's, it's huge, big opera house. And we were the main act at around midnight, and the audience was been drinking for hours. And it's an hour-long improv show, all 100% improvised, 60-minute improv show, me and two other guys. And about three minutes in, the audience just starts like horribly booing. Like, this is, you, you're horrible, get off, this is horrible. And you're like, wow, we gotta do this for another 50, 50. <laughs> like we're gonna be here for 58 minutes. And they paid a lot of money, they paid a lot of money and they're very drunk and they're very angry. Um, but that goes away, you know, you get backstage, you're like, well, that was weird. Um, but delivering bad news to your team is, you know, they're, everyone's relying on you and you feel like you're the, you used, to, you used to tell people, you know, you've got a couple thousand people working for you. It's like you're the mayor of a small town, but it's like you're, it's also like you're the father of everyone in town. Like you're only as happy as the unhappiest people in the town, you know, and um, having to deliver bad news to the team is, you know, it's super stressful. Uh, last one. And then, you know, you have to be forthright with everybody too. Yeah. So you have to kind of remind yourself going, Bill Campbell, the late Bill Campbell, who famously was on the board at Apple and Steve's close friend, Steve Jobs. Um, and, you know, and the Google folks um, wrote a book about him, Trillion Dollar Coach. Um, he was Larry Sergey and Eric, Larry Sergey and Eric's coach at Google. Bill always used to even say, um, you know, write down bad news so that you that you need to deliver to the team so that when you deliver it, you make yourself say it exactly the way you wrote it down and you don't like add flowery words or sugarcoat it or say anything else. And, you know, when he first told me that, I thought, that's weird. Like, I'm going to deliver bad news. And then when you have to actually yeah. do it, like, oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. like, you know, of course, he was, of course, he was right. Last one. What's your most unpopular opinion? These are not really rapid fire, by the way. I'm giving like 19 minute answers okay. to your rapid fire. It's supposed to be like, yes, no, yes. Sure. Uh, what's my most unpopular opinion? I'm not a big fan of, uh, I, well, it certainly got me in a lot of trouble. I'm not a big fan of the, hey, don't bring, um, you know, don't bring your political attitudes into work. Don't bring your, you know, attitudes about, you know, society and, how society needs to change into work. And my perspective is like, well, okay, then what are we gonna talk? What can we talk about at work? Like, it just strikes me as weird. I mean, business and society are in inextricably linked. And, you know, most of these companies we're talking about, most of our companies have customers that reflect the makeup of society. And if we don't talk about the issues society's having in general, how are we gonna understand how to run the business that, our, our customers are leveraging when our customers are are what society looks like. It just strikes me as weird. It strikes me as a version of the old of the um, of the admonishment to LeBron James of shut up and dribble. Like, well, LeBron James is a whole person. And he's got a lot of attitudes, and why can he only talk about basketball? Um, so I'm not a big fan of the hey, don't bring your politics to work stuff. Feels like that's changed a lot recently. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get, look, look, if it's the only thing, you know, if the, someone's on Slack all day and they're, and it's, and it's, you know, uh, they're writing 19 paragraph messages on Slack and they don't do anything else. Like, obviously that's a problem, but the notion that that has to be replaced by, Hey, 
we're here to do X, Y, Z and make money, not talk about politics strikes me as just weird. I mean, I, we're in society, the society that made the rules that's enabling this business to thrive. We're all part of it. We should talk about it. Probably harder to do when you're leading Twitter, given what Twitter is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's impossible to not talk <laughs> about politics in society when you're running Twitter. All right. I remember someone told me, someone asked me, you know, when Facebook first started getting into, you know, hot water in 2016 after the after the elections, someone said, what do you think? It's, what do you think is going on over at Facebook right now that they're having this bad press about them? And I said, I got to be like hard because they've they've been like crushing it and they've been the 900 pound gorilla and everything's been going their way. You know, at Twitter, if there was a negative article in New York Times about us, we called that Tuesday. So, you know, the, the, it just makes you resilient when you're running these companies where that stuff's happening all the time. And I thought that was great. Like people would leave Twitter and go to other companies and then call me and go, oh, it's easy. Bored. Everything's, going, everything's working great over here and no one's complaining. No <laughs> customers are complaining. It's boring, I wanna come back. <laughs> All right, let's get to the topic at hand, which is building teams. So one of the labels I threw on you was serial entrepreneur. You had like three companies between Second City and then Twitter, uh, a, a website development company, Spy On It, cool company, creepy name, uh, creepy and, name. Then, and then FeedBurner, which you sold to Google for like $100 million. Uh, right. And you had a computer science background, so, so pr presumably you knew something about computers and the internet, and that's what got you into it. <laughs> but the first startup came like right after you do an improv, right? So like, yeah. where where did you source the team from for that first? I spent a little. I spent a little bit of time at Anderson. I spent more than a little bit of time. I spent some time at Anderson Consulting between improvising. I'm, I was improvising while I was at Anderson Consulting, so I spent a little bit of time at Anderson Consulting, and those folks and I went off and started the the, the first company. The big lesson learned about. Um, building teams from scratch um, for me was in the beginning, you want generalists because people need to be able to do everything. And if you've got someone who's like, Hey man, I only use Jupyter notebooks for this particular data science thing. And I don't go over here and do this. And I don't go do this other thing. You just, you know, you're going to have people who are um, sitting around not doing anything for a lot of time. So I used to call them stem cells um, or, and actually in, in um, this is a stupid analogy maybe, but in football, when they draft players, they sometimes say like, well, I'm just going to dra draft the best available athlete. I mean, I'm not going to draft a wide receiver. I'm not going to draft a quarterback. I'm just going to draft the best athlete and we'll find the right place to put them. And, and when you're first getting started, finding the best available athlete or a stem cell, meaning someone who can go, I can go be a, I can go be a this, I can go do BD, I can go buy office supplies. Like those are the people you have to have in the company. And then as you grow, and this is, goes for teams too, engineering teams, you know, uh, design teams, et cetera. As you grow, you start bringing in more and more specialists and then people who understand how to manage those specialists. But my biggest lesson learned was you can get really, um, you, you can save yourself a lot of pain and suffering by bringing in generalists to begin and then specialists after that. On the, when you're hiring for generalists, what is that, what do you, what does the interview process look like? What are you actually testing for? How do you know you found somebody who's, you know, above the bar on best available athlete? You can ask them how they think about other other domains that they're not particularly familiar with. And if they say things like, you know, well, I've never spent any time on that and it sounds horrible. You you know, I don't want to and I don't want to, you know, you time to move on. But the other thing I would interview for, um, the other thing I would interview for is self-awareness. You know, again, when you're hiring generalists, you want people who know if they don't know the answer. You know, you want people who whatever it is, whatever the old saying is, you know, I know I, I know what I don't know. Um, and so it would. I would interview for self-awareness a lot. Um, I would interview for, um, um, you know, asking people like, hey, if I'm at a bar with you and your friends, what are they giving you a hard time about? Um, and then later on in the same interview, I would say things like, look, if you're gone now and it's still me and your friends, and now I ask them, you know, um, hey, well, what do you give this guy a hard time about? Do they say the same thing or do they say something different? You know, you quickly find out if someone's self-aware or not. Fascinating. Was there anything that you learned from like the first one or two experiences building at that the generalist startup stage that you then like applied to Fever? Like, did you do it differently at all the third time around? Yeah, I would bring in, I 
I, the first couple of times I brought in specialists too soon, too quickly. Um, and I think the lesson learned was you can, you want to bring in generalists, you want to take generalists pretty, pretty far. Um, and then, you know, when you're maybe 30, 40, 50 people, you start bringing in specialists, but you want people who can wear a lot of hats in the beginning and that, that can get you a long way and, and, you know, save you a lot of <clears throat> drama with people who are like, Hey, I thought I was going to be doing X, Y, Z. Yeah. I was going to actually, I was going to ask you about what the milestone is to make that transition from generalist to specialist. It's, 30, 40, it's, farther, it's further than you think it is or farther than you think it is, whichever is grammatically correct. <laughs> right. Uh, farther, I don't know. I'm going to, I'll go with farther. Uh, what is it about like that? Num is it that, is it a number of people? Though? No, okay. it's not really a number of people. It's just like you're looking for, you're trying to fill the gaps. You know, you've got all these gaps when you're first getting started. You know, today the forest fire is customer success. Tomorrow the forest fire is, hey, we need someone who can do phone interviews with these two engineers. The next day the forest fire is, look, we don't really have, uh, have um, people who know how to interview graphic designers or, you know, whatever the gap might be. Or, oh, we've got to sign this contract. Our lawyer, you know, is our lawyer any good? I don't really know because we don't have anyone here internally who is a lawyer who knows how to review a contract. So you're just trying to fill gaps in the beginning and and um, and not have to hire tons and tons of people to fill the gaps. So it's that. It's when you feel like, all right, we've kind of got all the bases covered now, and we now we really need someone who understands, you know, data science, or we really need someone who focus on refactoring the back end or, you know, sharding this database because the system's too slow now and we need to do X, Y, Z to the data. You, and then, you, you know, you, it's, it's all by feel. You can kind of yeah. figure it out. What, but what in the beginning, you really are looking for folks who can just fill all the gaps. And, and that means you need more generalists than you think you do. When you go from that, that team of generalists to then a team of specialists, all of a sudden you're trying to bring people on the team who have like a next level set of experiences or, or yeah. skill set than what you have on the team, which maybe creates a weird dynamic in terms of like knowing if who you're interviewing is good or not. Like how does a generalist know whether the real specialist software engineer is actually at the right level? Like how did you, how do you navigate that transition? It's a great question. I mean, the short answer is I would use, I would always go sort to outside people and, and ask them to talk to this person. Like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm interviewing this person for a VP finance role. Um, the person in here now is a controller, you know, both of us understand the basics of FP and a, but, and I would ask people outside the company who had done it before, hey, can you hop on the phone with this person and, you know, see if they've got the chops to do this and, and, and figure out what I'm, what I'm not asking that I should be asking. So it's, it's you know, and you've got, you've got investors and other people that, you know, around the company that you can always go to for those things. And I think that's totally appropriate and fine. And you should, you should lean on them. Um, so, and that, that's what I did. Yeah. So like a little external interview board that you can yeah. you know, and extend your team. And you know, that that's when, you, when you're bringing in those specialists, that's when you go to the external specialists and around the, you know, people that you know in the industry and look, you've all, I'm sure you guys have done favors for people and we've all done favors for each other and calling them up and asking them, can you hop on the phone with this person for 15 minutes and just see if they understand X, Y, Z about whatever the, the subject matter might be that I don't really know enough about. That's totally fine. I think that's totally fine. and happens all the time. Makes sense. Um, so you had the three startup experiences, then you joined Twitter as COO. They were what, like 90 people when you joined or so? No, no, no. They were like, no, there were about 45 people, 40, 45, 45 people. 45. Yeah, we were at 539 Bryant, I remember. There was a big hole in the floor in the concrete in the floor at 539 Bryant. I think there were about 40, 45 people um, split into two little offices there on the, on, in 539 Bryant. Yeah. What, what was it like? To, to not be the founder of the company? Like you'd been the founder of um, three, like what, what was the transition like? Yeah, it was, um, it's, a, it's a great question. It was weird for me because in the other companies, I was just, I used to tell Jack Dorsey this when I was CEO and he was chairman and we would be in um, product review or something and he, he would come once in a while and sit in. I always told him, Look, you always have to remember you speak with the authority of the, you know, you speak with the authority and the fluence, fluency of the founder of the company. Um, so when you say things, 
they carry a lot more weight than when, you know, the guy who's been CEO for two years says things because you invented the product. So, you know, always remember that when you speak about something, even if it's just some random off the cuff opinion you have, you're speaking with the authority of the founder. I think that's one thing that um, is just important for founders to remember because you'll walk around the hallway during the day and you'll, you know, you and Ben at Bright Hire, you know, cut to a year or two from now, you're, you're a couple hundred people and you walk through the hallway and you go, that's weird. I don't really like that. And to you, it's just making some random comment to your friend while you're having coffee in the morning and 14 people heard it and run back to their desks and are like, Teddy said, that's horrible. You know, stop doing that. And, you know, two days later, you're like, what, what do you, what's that? Why did everyone stop doing that? Um, and, uh, but it happens and it'll start, it, it also turns into a, it's funny, Satya Nadella, when he became CEO of Microsoft, he went on this sort of listening to her and he, he came down to Twitter and he talked to me and he said, you know, what should I be aware of now that I'm CEO? And I said, Sacha said is going to be a thing that you've never heard before, but is now going to be a reason for things inside Microsoft. Exactly. And you're going to hear it and go, I never said that. I don't remember saying that, but Sacha <laughs> said is going to become a reason for things because yeah. it's the Trump card, right? If someone says, well, you know, I don't agree with that. Well, Sacha said it's important then it just becomes the trump card that no one will just disagree with. And even if you didn't say it, people will start to use your name as the authority for things. And, you know, Jeff Wiener and I used to talk about this all the time. So Jeff got to the point where he would walk around the company and every time he said something, he would just go, look, this is just one man's opinion. Right. Don't go change what you're doing based on this before he, before he said anything or before he gave his opinion on something. Right, but everybody's still like, yeah, but that one guy's the CEO. So yeah, right. So that's like no. It's just of- it's different being the founder. You just have yeah. this authority that you don't have if you're appointed to a role. You know, again, the founder invented the product and conceived of it. And when they say something, you're like, you know, when I first created this, I meant blah. That's way more. You know, that's way more powerful than I think we should go left. Yeah. So so you got brought on as CEO. What was your actual? Was your job like? go figure out how to make money? Like what was the what was the actual job description, you know, the scope of the role? Yeah, when I was brought, when I was brought in as COO, the job was figure out what the business model is. And, you know, we quickly decided that because Twitter was um, a platform where the tweets could go anywhere, they could go to, they could go to other applications, they could go to, you know, they could go, th- there was an API that you could use to deliver them to other platforms. We just decided that the only way to the the only way that made sense to monetize it at the time um, was to deliver ads that were content, um, meaning ads that were tweets themselves, because the tweets were the things that the API delivered, and we didn't know where they were going. They went out, they went to all sorts of third parties on our own and our own platform. So the the monetization had to be something that went everywhere. The the API supported, which meant the ads had to be tweets themselves. So it was actually this, you know, the fact that um, the business model was um, in-stream, um, in-stream ads that were content themselves that you could interact with was novel at the time. You know, Facebook at the time in 2009, 2010, the ads were over in the sort of the same way, same way Google ads were. They were in the, in the demilitarized zone on the right-hand side of the page. Um, and the content was in the stream. We were the first ones to sort of do the in-stream advertising, and then everyone quickly realized, oh, that's actually a better way to do it. So I'm I'm curious about the team implications, right? You were basically brought in to, to monetize the, the platform and then build a team to to execute on that. And yeah, you, know, you were in this, you did like a podcast with Recode a couple of years ago. You talked about one of the lessons from improv was like, you need a mix of intellectuals and slapstick. Like you need like, Rachel Dratch, Dartmouth grad, and Chris Farley like swearing and taking a shirt off and falling through a table. And like the combination of those two things is like what makes magic happen. Was your job basically like find the Rachel Dratches and bring them into Twitter? Like was it was it like bring the suits, bring the the 4.0 GPAs into Twitter? No, I used to tell the, I mean, I used to tell the team, you know, of course there's a tension between, hey, we need to do this for users and hey, we need to make money. And this is not my um, line, but I used to tell the team, might be from Umer Haik, by the way, um, but I used to tell the team, 
like we should think of revenue as oxygen. Revenue is not the purpose of life. That's not why we're here, but it's necessary for life. Like you don't, you know, the purpose of living isn't to breathe, but without it, there is, it's over. So we should think of revenue like oxygen. We have to have it in order to fulfill our goals. And our goals are these other things over here, X, Y, Z. Um, and I thought, I always thought that was a great way to think about it. Like the purpose of why we're here is not revenue. The purpose of why we're here is to accomplish these other things, give voices to the smallest voices on the planet, the people who are, who don't have a voice, the people who are marginalized. And that's what we have to accomplish. And in order to accomplish that, we've got to go make money to power this, you know, platform that we've created. Uh, I think that's a great way to describe it to the team. And that's the way we always described it internally. And I think everybody bought into that and, and believed in it. Did that, did that approach color who you brought on to the commercial team at Twitter? Like, I, you, you know, you led a relatively mission-driven organization, you know, like values first. Like, how did that play into the, the hiring profile of the commercial team? Um, it didn't. Uh, it didn't. So what what one of the interesting things that happened, though, um, is so I had an engineer. I don't even remember who it was actually at, this, at, at, at the time, but I had an engineer that moved from the advertising from the from the revenue engineering team to the back end, you know, the Twitter back end um, platform engineering team. And he came up to me in the hallway one day and he said, hey, are we supposed to have one on ones with our managers here or not? And I'm like, okay, that question's coming from somewhere. Like, why are you asking me that question? And uh, he said, well, when I was on the revenue engineering team, uh, my manager said, you know, all of my engineers have one-on-ones with me and it's about their career and you need to meet with me a half an hour a day. And then when I transferred to platform engineering, my manager on platform engineering said, we don't have one-on-one -on -one meetings here at Twitter. And I realized what was happening that all of my engineering leadership, well, for not just engineering, leadership in every department, go to market, product, design, engineering, they were all managing based on the success biases or the or the selection biases from wherever they'd come from before. You know, and if, if they came from Google, they did do this. And if they came from eBay, they didn't do it. And I was like, huh, <laughs> that's fascinating. So I actually called Ben Horowitz because he had written a couple of blog posts about this kind of stuff. And he said, yeah, that used to happen. Um, that happened at LoudCloud, you know, back before it was Andreessen Norowitz. He and Mark had started this company. And so I actually started my own management class so that people would manage the way I wanted them to and not from wherever they came from. And I thought that was a great idea. So I wrote my own management class um, and I spent, it was about a six hour class. I split it over three days because no one needs to listen to me for six hours in one day. So I do three hours one afternoon and three hours the next day about, um, and it was broken into three sections. It was setting direction and, um, and, uh, and, and improving your team and, and, you know, and, and getting the team to work together as a team. Um, and, 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 and sort of a, some thoughts about the kinds of meetings to have and, and the kinds of meetings not to have. Um, and that was it. it got people work. It got people basically managing the way I wanted them to and in a consistent fashion. If you, if you had gone back and, and, you know, went back to the point where you were building the team and selecting the leadership. Is there any way to avoid the, I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to do it that way because you're selecting for people or is it just like, you're just selecting for raw leadership capability and you have to put people through that sort of exercise to get everybody on the same page. But everybody, everybody brings their biases from where they've been before and what they've done before and what worked. So if you want to get people working in consistent fashion, you just have to make sure they all understand what you understand to be the way we're going to work here. And so it became obvious to me that I, and I taught the class myself because I wanted people to understand this is so important to me yeah. that I'm going to teach this myself. And so you better, <laughs> so you better, you better manage the way, you know, you better manage this sort of according to these frameworks because it's, it's this important to me that I'm spending time with you. And, you know, it was all sorts of, I mean, it's not um, terribly um, arcane stuff. It's, you know, push decisions down the stack, like let people own their decisions. Ownership is authority and accountability. 
you can't tell someone what to do and then hold them accountable to the success of it. Like they're going to go, well, that was your stupid idea, you know, and it didn't work. So now what do you want me to do? I don't feel particularly bad that it didn't work because it was your idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you tell people the problem and say, hey, figure out how to fix this. And it needs to be sorted in the, you know, somewhere between this time frame and that time frame, yeah. you know, and you're smart, you're a smart team. You guys will figure out how to do it they'll feel accountable to it. And then, you know, you can hold their feet to the fire on those kinds of things. But, you know, telling people what to do is not a particularly good way to get the team motivated. And uh, so there was stuff like that. Look, push decisions down the stack. Don't tell people what to do. Don't use my name. Don't say Dick said is the reason for anything. Mm -hmm. um, and all sorts of other stuff like that. You know, and I would always tell my managers, your job as a manager is not to be omniscient. You know, you don't have to know all the answers. Plus, if you pretend you know all the answers, you think people are fooled. Nobody's fooled, you right. know. So yeah. you're just going to create misery and they're going to go around going like that guy thinks he knows all the answers. And he obviously has no idea what he's talking about. So, you know, if you're going through something in a meeting and someone asks your opinion and you don't know. Say, I don't know. Like, I don't have any idea. There were plenty of times in leadership meetings at Twitter where someone would say, what do you should we do A or B? And I would say, I'm don't have any idea whether which of these two things is the right one. We should pick. They don't seem like particularly existential problems. So let's pick one and do it because the biggest risk here is missed opportunities. So let's act, let's do something. You know, this is sort of the Jeff Bezos bias to action. Right, right, right. Let's do something. If it doesn't work, we'll go back and go the other way. And let's just be smart about not, you know, over committing to doing this thing we decided um, and pay attention to whether it's really working or not. And were you leading all this now as CEO? Like was that the the yeah the virtue yeah, yeah 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 so yeah. I'm curious like so you make the transition I want to re rewind the tape just for a sec because you make the transition from COO to CEO did you interview for the job like what is the what does the interview process look like for a CEO or did they just tap you and say Dick you're going to be the CEO now like what it was more just getting tapped and saying hey you're going you need to come in you need to do this it was more it there was no really no interview for it good idea bad idea. <laughs> Should you interview? For this? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, you know, ask <laughs> <that well. laughs> it's fun. It was fun. I love, I loved the team. I mean, and the people that I got to work with there, I'm still friends with literally, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Maybe a hundred people there. I still like hundred, 150 people there. I still keep in touch with, um, and made tons of friends there. I loved managing the team. I loved working with the team. I loved helping people develop their careers. So many of those folks have gone on to start their own companies or be, you know, leaders at other companies. I keep in touch with tons of them. Uh, that stuff was a blast. I loved that stuff. Um, yeah, I just think about it in terms of like the interview is also like a, you, know, you try to give a preview of what the job is going to be. You make sure that somebody knows what they're getting themselves into. And obviously the CEO is just like a very different order of magnitude. You're now not just responsible for your team, yeah. but you've got external shareholders and stakeholders and the media. It's a whole bunch of different responsibilities that you have to step into. Like, did how much of it did you conceptualize before you got into the role? None of it. I mean, the biggest thing I did, the most important thing I did was bring in other CEOs who had managed huge global teams and put them on the board. So Peter oh. Chernin from 21st Century Fox. So I got him you know, Twitter is a technology company, a technology company in the media business, if you will. Um, so had Peter Chernin from 21st Century Fox, who had managed 40, 50,000 people around the world, um, uh, join the board. And David Rosenblatt, who had um, been brought in as the CEO of DoubleClick and, and sold that to Google and then was at Google for some time, is now the CEO of First Dibs, which just went public, um, and had so had run a huge advertising business. And those people were immensely helpful to have on the board of directors. And I could go to them for, you know, and, and then Campbell was also there, Bill Campbell. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those those folks all taught me always make sure you're focused on the highest leverage thing you can be focused on, right? Mm -hmm. What's the highest leverage thing I can be doing right now? Because as, as see, especially if you understand the details, it, and this is particularly probably true for founders who invented the product and understand how they want it to work and know the details and even know the code. Um, your, your tendency is to want to get into the weeds on everything. And you, you constantly have to ask yourself, 
look, if I get in the weeds on this thing, is this like something that affects like four users and one small, you know, customer who signed up two weeks ago, but not the 99% of our, our other customers or users? And is this the highest leverage thing I can be working on? Mm. It, it's super important. And otherwise you're just, you know, kind of jumping around from random forest fire to forest fire. And your job as the CEO is to be doing forestry management, not, you know, not, not, not fighting individual forest fires. What, uh, what was it like to recruit for the board? It's actually an interesting, like people don't really hmm. think a lot about, okay, I need to build, I have open seats on the board. Are you building? Are you building? Yeah, are you interviewing folks? Like, what is the recruiting process that people look like to get folks onto the board? It's hard. <laughs> I was trying to find people from all different walks of life that could. It's actually not. It's actually interestingly not different than the way I talked about starting the company. Hmm. You're trying to fill the gaps, right? So the problem is as a well, problem. The challenge as a technology founder or technology company CEO is you generally have people on the board who are investors. They're, this person led the seed and this person led the A and this person led the B. And maybe they have some operating experience but probably not tons. Um, you know, there aren't, they maybe built a 40 person company and sold it to Facebook and now they're a VC. I mean, I'm not belittling that. They just don't have, you know, they haven't run 1,000 person, 2,000, 4,000 person companies, global companies. So you're trying to find people to fill the gaps that you have in the subject matter that you're working on as a board. You know, and we were in the, again, we were a media business. Uh, we were a technology company in the media business. So I was trying to always find people to fill gaps. Um, so um, Marjorie Scardino, who was the, um, editor at uh, The Economist and the a FT and The Economist um, was someone I had in, uh, brought in who really understood um, news and, and journalism because Twitter became obviously so important to journalism and news. So after I had um, Peter and, uh, and uh, David Rosenblatt on the board, I was like, man, we really need someone who understands news really well. Um, in journalism and Marjorie Scardino was the person we went and, and found and were able to get there and she's fantastic. But it's really, it's really hard. You're trying to fight, figure out whether, does this person just wanna be on a board and get like, be able to write, I'm on this board and get compensated for it? Or are they gonna, you know, are they gonna roll up their sleeves and dig in? You know, am I gonna, am I gonna call them and they're gonna go, sorry, I'm on, you know, I'm scuba diving in Australia again. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'll call you back in two weeks. Um, yeah, you know, so did you test a hard problem? Like, picking up the phone and calling people? Like, how did you? How did you test? No, yeah, you know, you're trying to find out. Like, is this person available or are they like not available? You know, you'd text them and hey, I have a question about X, Y, Z, and you know, do you get called back by them or do you get a text from an assistant saying, you know. <laughs> please yeah. Let's email get me at, 18 weeks out yeah wow. email me at info at <laughs> <laughs> what was the time you talk about like filling the gaps and you know it's one thing to say i'm filling the gaps in this role but i'm you know internally and this person then is going to grow and they're going to evolve and the challenges will change and there will be another role for them to play it's very different on the board like what's the time horizon that a, that you believe a gap has to fill in order to pull somebody into a board seat and say i want to fill this gap with that person is it like existential forever is it five years is it i'm going to fill a gap for this year like how do you think no you're, just, well, you're trying to you're just trying to you know <clears throat> you're just trying to field a team that that thinks about things and looks at things and and has a diverse enough perspective across the spectrum of people on the board to give you a complete if you will, opinion about mm -hmm. things like, do we really have a 360 degree view of this problem or do we not, or do we have a bunch of blind spots? It's not something that has to be resolved right away. And you're not looking for it to like, you know, I never expected any of these people to be on the board forever, kind of expect it to be a few year thing. Um, but you're just trying to figure out what your blind spots are. You know, one of the things I loved on, we haven't touched on this yet, but I'll just mention it here. When you're, in your own management team, one of the other things you're looking for is, you know, I always wanted a couple people in the room in my management team meeting who were contrarians, you know, not for the purpose of being contrarians, because that's sort of just annoying, but, 
you know, my CTO, Adam Messenger, was um, was particularly great at, you know, hey, um, why do we still think that? Do we still think that's true? Like, yeah, we, yeah, you know, person A, person B, person C, person C, person D in the room. Like, yeah, that's for sure true. I'll, we all know, obviously, you know, at one point there was this sort of saying um, early on in Twitter, you have to tweet in order to really get Twitter. If you don't tweet, you won't really ever get it. And I remember Adam, I remember vividly Adam saying at one point, do we really, do we still believe that? Wait, why do we believe that? Is there data that, you know, and when you, and then of course, as you, as anyone who uses it would yeah. now know, when we dug into it, it's not actually true. It had just become, it was this dogma that at first was, you know, for some reason, some test had been run, some experiment in the early days had been run, and that was the conclusion that was drawn. Yeah. And then it just became dogma, and everyone walked around saying, like, well, obviously, as we know, you know, and I remember Adam saying, like, why do we, why do we believe that? Do we still think that? And just having someone who is a little bit of a contrarian in the room or willing to ask, you know, is this thing that's written up on the wall actually true? Or, and, you know, maybe it was true two years ago and isn't anymore. That actually led to a whole, one of the things we would do once in a while on our management team meetings is we would ask ourselves, what is it taking us too long to learn? And why is it taking us so long to learn that? Or why did it, yeah. what did it take us? What are the things that took us too long to learn? And why did it take us so long to learn that? Nine times out of 10, it was because there was just some commonly held belief that X is true. And so it was never retested. Um, and so those are great things to do as a, as a management team. And those are great people to have on the team. You know, it's not, when I say contrarian, it's not the person that's like, everyone says white, so I'm going to say black. It's just the person who's like regularly questioning, wait a minute, where's the data that supports why we all are, uh, why we're all nodding our heads at that. Yeah. Does, does that approach apply to, to hiring with respect to like, this person for this role needs X, Y, and Z, right? In their background and their experience, like we can all assume that that's the case. We all like just agree, hey, this is how we hired before, so this is what this person needs. Like, have you ever found folks effectively pushing back and say, do we need all this, all these things in a hire, or can we bring somebody on the team who actually doesn't have that profile? One hundred percent. Yeah, I was always open to. You know, I always viewed those requirements, whatever they're, whatever you wanted to call them, um, those things as guidelines. Not if they don't have X years of experience, they can't come here. That never and was never a big believer in that. How do you experience is sometimes? I mean, this is not always true, and it's a gross generalization. But experience is sometimes the just the illusion of competence. Just because you've been doing X for ten years doesn't mean you're better than someone who's been doing it for a year. How do you scale that across the team? Like mo I, honestly, most hiring managers are probably scared to hire somebody who doesn't fit, you know, these three things. It's like, you know, I'm an investor. I, I never get fired for investing in GE. Like I'm not gonna get fired for hiring this person who met all these criteria. But if I take a bet on, take a flyer on this other person who's got a unconventional background, now I feel exposed. Like when, you know, Twitter gets, really large, right? Hundreds, thousands of people. You got a lot of layers involved. You have a re recruiting machine that's running. Is there any way to scale that commitment to say, no, we don't need actually all these things. We just need to find the best person. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. It's a really good question. And I don't, I'm not sure what the right answer is. Unfortunately, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll say it this way. You know, you always want to make sure you're managing to outcomes, not processes. So what do I mean by that? Like, what I mean by that is as a company grows, some, <clears throat> some problem eventually happens. Let's say there's a customer success problem with, you know, um, ABC widget company in Nashville, Tennessee, and they dump your product because, you know, you screwed up something. And so, of course, in the next, you know, management meeting, the CEO pounds the table and goes, I can't believe we lost, you know, XYZ widget company in Nashville, Tennessee, because we screwed up, blah, 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 blah. We have to make sure that never happens again. 
And so some process is put in place to make sure that the next time the customer rep calls on the boat, you know, and pretty soon there's a checklist for the for calling on a customer. And pretty and this goes for engineering too. Pretty soon there's a 17 page launch checklist. And um, I was just to tell the team, and this is important for CEOs, especially of growing companies to learn, you don't wanna to manage to processes. You want to manage to outcomes and the way to manage the outcomes is put in single individuals in charge of things. You manage the outcomes with ownership and operating structure, ownership and organization structure, putting individuals in charge, letting them find the best solutions and create the best solutions and holding them accountable to those solutions. If you manage the processes, pretty soon you're the TSA and you're making sure everyone takes their shoes off before they get on the plane and you're not worrying about whether you're not, you don't, you're not checking to see if there's a bomb on the plane. Hey, we made sure everyone took their shoes off and put them in the bins. And, and that, you know, everything slows down. Um, your results get poor, obviously. And, you know, nobody's, it's nobody's fault right. because, hey, we did everything on the 17 page checklist. So the way to solve for that and the way to stay entrepreneurial is always remind your leaders you have to manage the outcomes, not processes. And then secondly, and super importantly, you can never punish people for making mistakes. If you start punishing people for making mistakes, everyone's going to go around asking for permission before they do anything. Everything will grind to a halt. And again, you'll be managing the processes instead of the outcomes because well, the last time Phil screwed that up, he got fired. So make sure that never happens again. Right, it's right, the right. job of leader. It's the job of leadership to correct the mistakes when they happen. It's not the job of leadership to prevent mistakes from happening. Mm -hmm. So you want people to tell you the truth when mistakes happen. Tell leaders, you know, you're going to get in trouble not for making mistakes. You're going to get in trouble if you don't tell me when a mistake happens because I got to fix it as quickly as possible. Right. Um, and just and you know, and the other way to do that is to remind the team, like, hey, we're all going to screw things up all the time. Here's some things, and I would do that at all hands meetings. I would get up and say, here's the thing. Here's this, you know, hey, I really screwed up that reorg. It took too long. Because it took too long, people got really political. That caused all sorts of misery for people. That was totally my fault. Won't happen again. You know, right. next time it'll be done this way and that way. And that's on me. And then people understand, like, okay, well, no one's going to get in trouble here for admitting they made a mistake. It's not, it's not, it's not the job of leadership to prevent mistakes from happening. You just have to remind your team that all the time. There's a there's an interesting tension actually in relates to a conversation we had like a month ago or so. This idea of like manage the outcomes, not process. That makes sense. Yeah. But if you don't know what the process was that got to the outcome, then you can't replicate it. Right. So we were talking about hiring, and you said like we ran this study for interviewers where, you know, we knew that some people were just better interviewers than others. Right. Like higher signal, the people who they said yes to consistently turned out to be great. So you manage outcomes, put that person in the interview, they will deliver the right outcome. But if you don't know what the process is, you can't scale that. Like, did you ever figure out what those interviewers did differently so that you could help other people be better interviewers also? No, what you're talking about is we actually did this. I, I, I love I love this because it's weird. Um, we tried to figure out, are there people who are like canary in the coal mines for this person will be great or this person will be bad. You know, those those folks, you you interview them and some people are, everyone's sort of equivocal, but one person's like, no way, this, they're gonna be amazing. And then they come in and they're amazing. Like, our, and, and we, we had a couple people in engineering who were just canaries in the coal mine for either great or poor engineers. And so, you know, <laughs> so we we wanted them to do a lot more interviewing. Right. Of course, they're engineers, and so they hated that. And they were like, look, if you're just going to make me interview people, I'm going to quit. And we were like, this is a real conundrum. So um, I, and the, the short answer is, of course, the next, the next question, which you've just asked is, what are the things those people were doing in their interviews that, you know, no one else was doing? And we were never able to discover that or discern whether they're, was something they were just particularly adept at um, at understanding what was going to work and what wasn't. And that was not, a, turned out to be not translatable uh, knowledge, unfortunately. Crazy. Did you reward those people? Like, did you, did you compensate? Well, yeah, you, you, know, you would go to them and tell them like, hey, really, you know, you're going to need to do at least X percent more interviews than everybody else. But again, again, I'm laughing because they're like, 
can I, can, you know, I'm going to intentionally fumble on the goal line so I don't have to keep interviewing people because I want to write code. So you're like, it's, a, it, it's this, you know, <laughs> it's this, uh, it was a sort of a quantum physics problem where the more you actually observed that that happened and told them about it, the worse it was. Um, so anyway, it, it was one of those things where we never really found a good solution for how to, how to go deal with that. Uh, since they weren't able to translate what they were doing that was so different. Yeah, um, we talked a lot about your your vantage point on talent and management and people and hiring from the from the CEO kind of perspective. Now you're an investor, right? So now you've hands in lots of different companies. You're seeing them at different stages of growth. Is there anything that like you you've learned or that feels fundamentally different about how you're thinking about talent and building teams now from the outside in? The one thing that I would say is interesting from as an investor that we've learned from, we've just raised our second fund or starting to invest that. The thing that we've learned from fund one to fund two is um, the couple things we missed in fund one that really worked were we loved the founders, CEOs or co-founders. Um, and we saw when we really dug into the businesses, we saw either what looked to be like a fundamental problem with with the unit economics or look the you know incremental marginal marketing costs here are always going to be super high you're not going to get you're not going to get marginal returns on the next incremental marketing dollar it's going to marketing dollar it's going to be just as expensive to market product number 52 um some fundamental, some apparent or, or, hey, the customer success organization doesn't scale as we add customers, we have to keep on adding all these other customer success people, basically unit economics problems. Or, um, and the, the biggest lesson learned is in the two things we missed where there were obvious problems if you looked at the P&L. You were like, look, this is never gonna work. It's got this major unit economics problem. The two companies we missed that we loved the CEOs. They had enormous EQ, meaning just super emotionally intelligent, understood they didn't have all the answers, really trying to learn, great listeners. And that was probably our biggest lesson learned. Like if you if your gut tells you this person is amazing and they're like gonna they're like a sponge for knowledge and they want to learn and they want to they're gonna ask lots and lots of other people how to do things and they're constantly trying to get better and they're great listeners, ignore ignore the problem in the first, you know, in the p &L about the unit economics not working and trust the fact that this person will figure it out. Um, just investing in enormously high EQ people, um, if we had done that in the, you know, the fun, fun, our first fund is gonna be fantastic. If we had listened to that in, in, at the beginning and done a couple of things we didn't do, it would be even more fantastic. Um, so that was a big, big lesson learned for us. Just those kinds of people can overcome whatever the challenge is and they'll figure out a way around it and they'll resolve the problem and, you know, voila, now the, now the economics work. How do you think about your mission now? So you talked about at Twitter, revenue is oxygen. We need to breathe to be able to do these other things that are really meaningful for society, giving, you know, voices to the smallest people. How do you think about... In, as an investor, you have to deliver returns, right? That's oxygen. To achieve what? Like, what, what do you think about your mission? What's the what's the goal now that you're? The reason that yeah, the reason Adam and I are doing this is you know the reason I think it's fair to say the reason both of us stopped working at Twitter. I stopped. I, I resigned in 2015, and he resigned in 2017. Is you always want your job to be a combination of learning and doing, and it just got to the point. I think for both of us at Twitter, where it was like, okay, this is problem number 41, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. Oh, this is problem number 82. And you just kind of stop learning. Um, we view what we're doing here as um, learning a lot about all the different ways there are to be successful. I remember I tried to get, speaking of how hard it is to get people to join your board, uh, Jack Dorsey and I tried to get um, Bezos, Jeff Bezos, to join the board in 2011. Um, we just thought, wow, he'd be, he's seen it all, he's scaled everything, he would be an amazing addition to the board, you know, let's talk to him and see if we can get him to join the board. And I'll make a very long story short here. We were talking briefly about strategy 
and Jack said something like, you know, well, Steve, Steve Jobs was alive at the time. He said, you know, Steve says the most important part of strategy is saying no, and you should say yes to very few things. And your job as the CEO is to be sort of the editor in chief and, and say no to most things and just do a couple things. And, and uh, Jeff said, yeah, well, I like to do everything. And he kind of did that big Jeff Bezos <laughs> laugh. And he goes, my team has to talk me out of stuff. I like to do everything. And, you know, he, he kind of like looked at, you know, he looked at both of us after the laughter laughing and he get at laughing again and went, there's lots of different ways to be successful. And um, I just think that's, I've, I've always thought that was great. And one of the fun things about investing now is just seeing the different kinds of personality types that work and helping them figure out the kinds of people they need to surround themselves with based on whether they're an introvert or an extrovert or, you know, this or that. Yeah this kind of person um, and that stuff from the investor perspective and just helping people be successful is a blast. That's what I think Adam and I like the most. For, okay. Personal curiosity. The one of the things you talked a lot about from your improv days is this concept of like, yes. And or like be in the moment, yeah. live in play off yeah. the momentum. Where's the most valuable spot that that concept has played a role in your business life? Every management, job is 70%, 75% listening. All management is, all great managers are great listeners. And managers who listen to something somebody says and then deny that that's a problem or ignore that person and then defend the status quo and continue marching in wherever the direction they are marching, are just great misery for their teams. And in the best organizations in the world, Everybody understands what the CEO understands. They understand how to be successful in their roles and what it means for both them and for the company if they do what they need to set out to achieve. And when they tell management there's some situation is screwed up, management accept that it accepts that that person's perception is true. Yes, and is all about saying, I accept that what this per person just said is their reality. And I, great, let's see what we can go do about that and 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 deal with it instead of. That can't possibly be true. Like when people work up the courage to go tell management how screwed up something is and management ignores them or denies that that's a problem. Can you like what's more depressing than that? And imagine how much dysfunction that causes in the organization. No one's going to tell you when there's a problem anymore. I just mentioned the most one of the most important things you want to do is find out when there are problems so you can correct them quickly. They know that, you know, you think they're fooled. Nobody's fooled. You're just creating misery for the organization. So that 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 listening and yes and like accepting the truth of what this just person just told you as their reality and dealing with it is possibly the best management technique there is. The best way to make decisions, look, you can always, I could always tell at Twitter if someone screwed up a decision-making process. What do I mean by that? Best way to make the, the best way to make this decisions is to gather feedback from the team. You know, how do you feel about, how should we think about X, Y, Z? Make a decision and then own the decision yourself. It's your, you know, you can't say like, well, you guys wanted to do it. You know, make the decision right. that needs to be made, own the decision and then communicate it. Listen, decide, communicate. It gets screwed up all the time. Why, one of the reasons it gets screwed up is because people just make a decision without going and gathering feedback about something. And I could always tell at Twitter if some department or some leader, director, manager, VP made some decision and communicated it, if there were like 95 email responses to some decision that had been made in the communication around it, I would know immediately like this person didn't pay any attention or didn't gather any feedback about this decision that had to be made because they've made this totally arbitrary and capricious decision. And because they didn't listen, if you don't listen, you can't communicate. Because they didn't listen, they now can't communicate the context for the decision effectively, and everyone thinks they're crazy and wanted by the campus police. So you could always tell if people, managers weren't weren't good listeners and didn't gather feedback when they were making decisions. Awesome, Dick. It's been a pleasure. You're a mensch. Thank you for spending the hour. Super insightful, uh, and yeah, I appreciate the time. I've learned a ton. Awesome. Thanks for doing it. Uh, thanks for thanks for taking the time yourself, Teddy. This was That's a lot right. of fun. Thank uh, you, for everybody at home, uh, the next one coming up, uh, we'll send out a note about it. Uh, Kara Golden, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Hint Water, uh, is going to join. Talking about like building a SaaS business, try selling water. 
as a business. That is hard. Uh, it's been like 16 years at it. She's got an awesome story. So that's the next one. But uh, Dick, again, thank you for joining us. Super fun conversation. And uh, enjoy Paris. Happy to do it. All right. Talk to you soon. See you. Ciao.